I am sitting down here with David Washburn, who is the author of two published works that have come out in 2023. That's Devils That Prey and Tickle Monster. They're they're all available now. Excited to talk to you about both projects, one of which I have read. Um, so David, how's it going? Good. How are you? I am I'm very, very good. Um what what's that like to have published two books in uh in one year? I'm just just curious because usually people have trouble just putting out one and and promoting them within a year's time. But you've done two. What's that been like? Um, well, it's been a, a labor of passion. Um, but also, I you know I can't take all the credit for it being like two full novels. One was a novella, and the other one was a project that I worked on for a majority of 2022. Uh, when I published Devils That Pray, it came out Black Friday last year, and it was a project that was pretty consuming from about April up until probably like the end of September, and writing that book was just all obsessive. All obsessive. With a, Love it. Yeah, Love it. And- I- Hey, I mean, as a writer myself, I know what that's like. And um, you've talked a lot about social media on your uh, your writing process, which I, I want to get into. But I also want to make sure that up front, we, uh, we give you a chance to actually pitch these works. So uh, Devil's at Prey, I have, I've read it, I've reviewed it. Very fun, sort of wrong turn style slasher, I would call it. Um, and Tickle Monsters, I have not. So if you're at a party and you're, you know, you're meeting someone for the first time and a friend comes up and goes like, hey, David here, he he writes books. They're like, what are they about? What do you tell them? Uh, well, Devils at Prey, it is a fast-paced horror cult slasher. Um, basically, it's a group of college freshmen. They're you know getting together. They're heading home on a road trip, and they start pre-gaming on the way home, and they, you know, have to detour from the highway, they take some rural back roads, and they pretty much are going through that part of America that is forgotten. And the community there feels very much the same. And when they're, you know, looking for a party and a good time, they're already drinking, and they start messing with the wrong people on the road. And they happen to mess with the people who are part of this uh, community of older folks who have a bone to pick with the younger generation. Um, It makes for a very fun night and a very intense, fast-paced read. And what about Tickle um, Monster? Tickle Monster is a much shorter selection and a very different pace. It's a colonial era. I, I call it a character study because it doesn't read like Devils That Prey does. Uh, Devils That Prey is a lot faster. It reads very much like a movie, a novelized screenplay. I've heard that comparison several times. Um, Tickle Monster, a lot different pace. I slow it down. Um, that one is, well, getting back to the pitch, um, it is character study set in the colonial times. It follows a young boy named Teddy who is told by his father, you know, whatever you do, don't go in the woods. I forbid it, basically. Um, There's, you know, a lot of mystery looming around that. But, you know, as he's growing up and, you know, becoming a man, he's starting to get that little rebellious energy where he's asking questions. He's wanting to do things, do his own thing. And uh, the story is very mundane, centered around the family. But when Teddy goes into the woods, he comes home and he starts having some, he has a bizarre interaction with a woman in the woods. And once he comes home, yeah, he's changed forever. And he starts having some experiences at bedtime and it takes a fun ritual with his father and turns it into something a lot more insidious. Well, who who doesn't like a little woodland horror? I think, you know, the woods are just ripe for horror. So I'll have to look at that one too. Funny enough, when... You know, when you were going to be on uh, on the podcast, when I found found out that you were going to be on the podcast, for some reason, I decided to go with the longer work rather than the the shorter one. But I'm really glad I did, because yeah. getting back to Devils That Pray, you mentioned, um, yes, it is very fast paced. You mentioned a lot of people have talked about it being um, sort of written in like a, like a movie style. Um, one thing I did want to ask you about uh, your writing style is that um, it is it is written in a really interesting way where it almost made me wonder if you do have a screenwriting background because there's a lot of um, prose that talks about characters are doing this. So-and-so is doing this and you sort of, you set the scene and you just let it play out. So was that was that intentional? Is that your style or is this something you, you did for the book? It, it was intentional, but it wasn't a thing that I set out to do because of screenplays. Um, some of the first things I've written in a 
you know, serious, intentional manner were screenplays. Um, some years ago, me and a few friends got together and we, uh, we originally set out to want to make short films. And, you know, we had did a few things, uh, nothing's available now. They, they were fun, but the problems we ran into when writing screenplay was you're limited by resources. You then have to coordinate jobs and who does what, availability, editing, everything that comes with shooting something. So you could take a three minute short film, you have to write a screenplay for it. There has to be a script if you're wanting to take yourself seriously. Um, problem we were running into is, you know, you can't write, you have to, everything has to be practical. Everything has to be something that you're able to shoot. So if you want to write a story about a car crash, you're not going to go buy a car and crash it, right? So it's, it's going to happen really, on screen probably, right? <laughs> yeah, and you're, you're really restricted to how much creativity you really have when it comes to something you're trying to shoot and film yourself. And then you throw in the complications of, hey, are you available this day? Oh, hey, we're waiting for weather. We need, you know, we're waiting for snow. We're waiting for heavy rain. Um, oh, we need to make a squib. And, you know, we're at this, you know, if we're making a horror film and we want to like a throat slash, you know, that's a, that's a big effort for a very short thing on camera. So um, starting with that, I had written several short screenplays with intention to film, and then we would water them down for practicality. And then eventually we just kind of fell out of it. But during that time, I had written a full length screenplay and I was shopping it around. Um, it was, it was a story called Blackwater. And it was just this uh, piece that I had written about the, uh, you know, all these states, this was like in 2017, states were legalizing marijuana while they were next to states that weren't. And I wrote a story about a small town that was right near the border of Missouri and Kentucky. And one state legalized it, the other one did not. So people, you know, from colleges in the town that wasn't legalized were coming to this town where it was legal and they were having these field parties. And it was about a sheriff who basically wasn't capable of handling this crowd. And it turned into a fast paced thriller right away. But to get back to your question about the screenplay background, that's about the extent of it. When I wrote Devils That Pray, it was from that experience, but I also, as a horror fan, I wanted to write in present tense. I wanted the feeling to put you into the character without speaking for the character. So you're basically reading the book as a fly on the wall as all these things happen in real time. Um, and then one thing too is the way the story is structured is you're following the, the, the protagonist for a little bit and then I'm switching it to the antagonist. You're getting this view of the antagonist peppered in with where it's, you normally wouldn't get that in a horror novel. And that's something that very much comes from telling a story in a movie format. You want to you want to spend as much time on your protagonist as your antagonist. So that was one of the things I kind of learned from writing screenplays and I just novelized it. And writing the novel was very much a learning experience. I've never written anything of like long form narrative before. So, uh, you know, it was, it was a lot of learning as I go. And I'd say today I'm still learning as I go. Absolutely. Yeah. There's even, um, uh, for me, there were uh, some influences from both screenplays and comic books because some sometimes it, it does actually, a chapter might start with, meanwhile, at the gas station, you know, and I really like that too. Um, yeah. It takes a... Uh, it, it, it takes about like a chapter to get used to, but one once you're in it, it uh, it actually does do. It has the exact def desired effect that that you put into it, um, which is great. And you mentioned um, sort of having this. There's there's two aspects of it, right? There's the rural versus urban kind of uh, clash of of mentalities, and there's also um, some generational. Um, uh, back and forth too. Um, where, where did this, where did this idea come from? I, I'm almost wondering if you, you had an experience in college where you like, you were on a back road and ran into some rural folks and, uh, got into a little tussle or something, but, um, where, where did the inspiration behind it come from? Uh, well, there was no tussle, but, um, kind of, so this, this can be a long winded answer too, but, uh, a few years back, me and my family, we, uh, we went on vacation to Myrtle beach. And when we were coming back, you know, it's a long drive from Myrtle Beach to Ohio. We were near North Carolina coming through South Carolina and we needed to get gas. So we get off the highway and, you know, when you're getting off the highway, you've got the signs that tell you like gas is this way, food is this way. And we, you know, go, going for gas, we go the direction of gas and we were driving for what felt like, you know, two to three miles and we we're just not seeing anything. It's just flat, boring fields, farmland. 
um, straight road for as long as you can see. And, you know, I'm like waiting to turn around, but there's no driveways anywhere because it's just fields and like ditches. And eventually we get to the gas station and the gas station pretty far from the highway. And it, it was literally as described in the book, it looked like it used to be a BP, but the convenience store aspect is like a general store. And when I was getting gas, my family went in and was getting snacks and using the bathroom. And I, I was leaning against the car and I'm looking around and behind the gas station, there's this massive barn. And I'm looking at this barn, there's fields and weeds in between it. And I'm just wondering, what do they use that for? Cause they're not taking care of the land really. And then there's like this vegetable stand right at the front of the road that, you know, no one's doing anything with, but then right behind me across the street, there is, you know, big, massive, you know, farm style house. And, uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking about it and I'm like, man, this is a really creepy area. And I bet this is terrifying at nighttime. And, you know, so then, then I go home and, you know, I go back to my normal life and for months, I can't stop thinking about this location. This setting is like buried in my brain. And, um, and, and then it, it just turns into a, a lot of my writing doesn't come from a place of like personal experiences. Usually it comes from what influences and inspires me from like, you know, whether it be horror movies or books I read or, um, but also anxiety. Um, if I have an interaction with something, it can be the most mundane thing. But if I think about it long enough, my brain will take a concept and run with it. Oh, that would be terrifying if, and then fill in the blank. That was very much this situation. I wonder what they do in that barn. Oh, what if it's like a VFW hall and people get together from this little area and no one would know it. What do they do in there? And uh, yeah, that's kind of where that idea came from. And then it just turned into, well, what's their motivation? What, what, why do they do this? Oh, if they're, you know, if we make them all old people and give them a common cause, oh, we've given them an enemy. Oh, they have a disdain for younger people. Oh, younger people are coming through. What happens when they get into these interactions with younger people? And then you start learning about things like the cleansing and uh, what I did with that. And then, you know, the setting writes itself because, one of my favorite things in horror is uh, man versus nature or putting someone in a setting that is clearly not their comfort zone. So when you put college kids from the city in this rural area around people who are used to hunting and used to, you know, fending for themselves and they, they're just having fun with it at this point, it, it can be quite terrifying. Mm -hmm. And I think there is sort of a natural fear um, that comes from, I mean, I've, I've been a city guy for a while and you, know, you take uh, university students and uh, college, college towns are very like everyone's doing something at all hours of the day. Um, it's very, it's very populous, but it's still a little disconnected. And there is something really creepy about a rural area where there's a lot of space and it's very quiet, but everybody knows each other. And if that entire town was out to get you and was actively trying to kill you, that would be absolutely terrifying, which is exactly how I felt while reading the book. So uh, that's that's the best thing I could say about it. Um, your anxiety thinking about uh, a situation like that, it, it definitely comes through in the book and comes through in the writing. So yeah, it's uh, it's one that that I've been uh, I've been recommending to people. Um, you mentioned your uh, your your influences. Uh, I'm wondering what what horror influences do you uh, sort of inform your work in uh, in both of these projects, whether that be movies or, or writers themselves. Um, well, it, it, writing it's never like, let me think of what can I, what, what do I want to take from something I love? It's just kind of, you know, when they say you're not writing, you're consuming something and what you consume is what's going to fuel your output. Um, some of my favorite movies are, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, uh, Wrong Turn, Hills Have Eyes, those kind of movies. I really love the more practical, realistic takes on horror. Um, a lot of people lean toward, you know, Freddy, Jason, Michael Myers, and those are all great, but they, they don't really scratch the itch for me to feel anything because I'm not scared to go to sleep. I'm not scared of a guy who drowned in the lake. And, you know, I'm not scared of Michael Myers because I've never had an experience where someone just won't go down. So, but when you put like a, like the movie Wolf Creek is one of my favorite movies. Um, you know, you got a guy with a sniper rifle who's just, he got bored hunting animals. So now he's hunting, you know, hitchhikers. Um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, very practical concept. You've got somebody who's been hidden away from the world and he's being pretty much groomed to be the muscle of the family and, you know, take out, you know, they got like a whole 
you know, murder ring going on within this little house. And then wrong turn, same concept, a community of outcasts, hills have eyes, same concept. And uh, I, I always really gravitated toward those type of movies when there's like a, there's a group or a very organized plot of people with a very, you know, deadly intent. And I always think that makes for the best horror, most uncomfortable for me at least. Awesome. Um, so switching gears a little bit here, because I think we've we've effectively got people interested in your writing at this point. You, you do a really great job of talking about it, by the way. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I was uh, I was looking through uh, some of your social media, which you're you're very active on, but you've also talked about um, going through spurts where you really hunkered down and you have to focus on your writing. Maybe you're not as active. Uh, how do you how do you balance the two? Because, you know, as as a writer, or any creative person selling your product is it's it's very important to be active on social media. So so how how, how do you balance that? Oh, man. <laughs> The, the balancing is a balancing act for sure. Um, and I'm still figuring it out a lot of times. Um, you know, obviously real life comes first. You've got responsibilities, a job, you know, family, things to do. Those things have to come first. I'm a very routine person. I always joke around and say that, you know, if I die suddenly, it's because someone knew where I'd be. And I'm a very rigid, routine, narrow person when it comes to uh, if anything, you know, happens suddenly, it throws off my plan. Uh, example is, you know, when we were originally supposed to do this interview, we were scheduled, but my day was like, oh, no, I'm not going to be home in time. Oh, crap. And, you know, it threw off everything that day. It was, it was football it, Sunday. It, it's all good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, that, that's just an example of like uh, a little thing can kind of derail that feeling. You know, if, uh, if I call off work, it's, you know, if I wake up late 30 minutes, it throw, you know, it throws off your entire day to show up late. There's a feeling of like, I have a lot to do, even if that's not the case, but it's just like, it's mental gymnastics for me. So getting back to the writing aspect is, um, I, I do talk about hunkering down and going into hiding almost because um, I'm, a, I'm a plotter. So I, I'm a believer of outlining. Um, I need a map, a guideline, a set of loose rules to follow when I get started on that first draft because when I hear other writers talk about you know chaos and motion pantsing um that stresses me out to hear about it and like I'm in I'm envious of it because when I hear people talk about it some of the stories that people come out with just from just going it, it's great but to me all I'm thinking about is oh man that second draft and those revisions those must be messy oh my god like I can't wrap my head around like how much work that must be on the back end so I always uh you know the expression like when you're uh doing like a DIY project measure twice cut once that's kind of my thinking with outlining is let me spend a lot of time on this outline I'm gonna have a lot of notes a lot of bullet points a lot of you know added notes to those bullet points and I want to make it as visual as possible so that when I begin writing I know exactly where I'm at. I know exactly what my characters are doing, thinking, feeling, where it's coming from. <clears throat> and then, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll make a separate character list. And, uh, and I'm, I'm just trying to make sure I'm encapsulating all that stuff. When, uh, <clears throat> when I, when I ba the balance, though, becomes what's going on in my life right now. What am I, what's keeping me busy as an author if I'm not writing? And a lot of that comes down to marketing, talking about my books working on uh you know getting artwork commissioned and things like that uh posting talking about it trying to do things like uh interviews book signings um author events whatever um and also short uh like anthology submissions when you see those submission callings those those are interesting to me too those keep me kind of busy when i get it when i see a concept that is calling and i get excited about it that kind of stops everything. So that kind of contradicts what I was saying about being rigid and routine because when inspiration strikes, you have to lean into it at the same time. And, uh, but yeah, so, so right now I have a book, it's a full length novel that I'm, I'm waiting to start. The outline is done. It's just a matter of, uh, I just, I'm trying to make sure that adapting to that is good. And then my routine outside of that works. And then once I find, an appropriate time that I can, you know, sit down, focus on writing. Um, I think the first draft is going to happen very quickly because the outline has already done most of the work for me. Okay. Well, I do want to come back to that, that book you're working on now, but 
Um, I, I love a lot, a lot of what you said about that, um, that outlining process in your writing process, because um, one of the best pieces of advice I've ever heard on writing is from Jordan Peele, who says, follow the fun, you know, and you say, when inspiration strikes, you, you just have to go for it, right before the idea kind of dies in your head, because I feel like, you know, as creatives, there's, you know, some self doubt kicks in and eventually you might go like, oh, maybe this idea isn't that great. But you know, if you if you try to get it out, and it's a fully formed idea, then you can just go back and sort of fill in the gaps, right? Um, yeah, I've actually uh, heard from some people who do an outlining process where the reason they do it is because there will be scenes that they're really excited about, and they'll write out of order so that they can kind of get through sort of the boring doldrums uh, connecting the scenes together. Um, but uh, going back to your your short form writing, um, do you do you feel like that? Do you treat that as sort of like practice for longer form? Is that a way for you to sort of hone your style? How does that inform the, the way that you write the longer projects? Um, you know what? I never really considered it, honestly, but I guess in a way it is practice. Um, it definitely is filling in the cracks between my own published works. It's something I guess I look at it as keeping myself busy. So I guess in a way it can be uh, honing my craft. Um, I also look at it as an opportunity to be experimental. Um, I have four short stories out there. Uh, two have been accepted. I'm not able to announce them yet. But oh, congratulations. Yeah, two, two, thank you. Uh, two accepted, two rejected. <laughs> Um, and the rejected ones, I'm you know just kind of setting aside for now, and I think I might retool them. One thing with these uh, short, uh, these anthologies that call for authors to send in stuff, um, a lot of them have workout limits. And when you're writing short form, one thing I noticed is I don't like writing with handcuffs. Word count limits feel like handcuffs, and it's like okay, well if I got you know leaning into the fun, as you said, if you've got an interaction with characters and you really want to expand on it. Well, now I'm, I'm, I, I feel I can't because I, I have to worry. I have to get to the ending I have in mind. And if I have this long conversation that takes, you know, a thousand words, I've, you know, eaten 20 percent of my story. If the you know, word count is 5,000 words, which is typically what they are. Um, so I, I look at it as an opportunity to be experimental. Um, one of the first stories I ever written in first person was one of these shorter submissions. And I actually really enjoyed it. And it was something that always gave me a little anxiety to put myself in the shoes of a character because when I've gotten used to writing in like a third person, first person, um, you know, outside perspective, I've gotten used to that. So I'm telling stories where I can focus on anything happening and, you know, that's the established rule set. But now when you put yourself in the character, you know, when you're writing as the character's voice, suddenly there's things you can't do in writing. You can't uh you can't depict what's going on with someone else or what's going on in their head because you're representing a specific voice and that was something that always kind of intimidated me as a writer so with these shorter forms i've leaned into that and i'm like well you know what if this gets rejected it is what it is it was fun and uh but yeah i i've i've had a lot of fun with it um uh, yeah i think i want to do more first person character stuff i don't know that it'll be the book i'm about to work on but it's definitely something I have in mind. And and the thing about it is you can always use those short stories and put them into collections. Like a, a lot of people do use short story collections and whether it's, you know, previously published work that, you know, the, um, the distribution rights kind of go back to you. Uh, e even the ones that are rejected, you can, you can bundle them together and, uh, and people definitely read them. Um, so you can't you can't talk about the stories that have been accepted into the anthologies, but what about the one that you've plotted that you're going to start writing soon? Can you tell us anything about that? Um, I could I could say a little bit about it. Um, okay. The the working title, which it's not going to be the final title. Um, I was calling it DIY Exorcism. <laughs> and uh, I, I love it already. It, yeah, the, the the concept came from um. I don't want to say too much, but it's basically a story about a father and a son. The father is a pastor of a small community church. He inherits the church from his father, who is a well-respected pastor and man of God. His father passes away. He's now running this church as a business and as a community leader. He's very much the face of the church. He's on social media doing like daily prayers. Um, but he's also dealing with the passing of his father. He's dealing with this community looking up to him. He's dealing with a divorce that is in progress. He's, you know, dealing with, you know, custody issues and shared parenting. 
with his son. He's trying to keep up this front that everything is okay. Um, during all of this, when he has his son one weekend, he's you know expected to do some church events. He's expected to you know be there Sunday for the sermon. Usually, the family's all there in the front, you know, keeping up the facade that everything's perfect. Um, when his son starts lashing out, and things happen, some knee jerk reactions happen, and now it's keeping father and son locked in the house, and ignoring phone calls and ignoring knocks at the door. And that's all I'm going to say about it. Mm. Well, between this and devils that pray, I'm starting to think that uh, religion is maybe a theme that, that is going to come up in your, in your works a little bit. What's your, uh, what's, what's your background with, uh, with religion? And uh, why do you think it's a, it's a good pairing with horror? If you do, in fact. Um, I, I'm not a religious person at all. Um and, you know, no, no knock on anybody that is, but uh, I, I think that there's something that can be terrifying about a group of people getting together over a belief that not everyone else is on board with. And I think religious fanatics and zealots, the things that people are willing to do in the name of God can be terrifying. And I, I think that has a great place in horror because of it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would I would hope most people agree with that. <laughs> in fact, yeah. um, I actually I actually feel the same way. I find myself drawn to uh, a lot of horror that does does have religious things because of the the groupthink aspect to it. Um, yeah. So yeah, uh, awesome answer there. Um, so having uh, having put out uh, two books recently, um, how do you how do you measure success? You know, uh, so far, do you feel like you've uh, reached a certain level of success that you didn't expect or do you think maybe you've uh, are, are there any any mistakes that you feel like you've made in terms of marketing that uh, maybe you'll you'll take into your next projects well it's constant learning and adapting as you go um, that's what I'm learning um, when I put out devils that pray it was, it was a passion project it was something I felt like I needed to do wanted to do I had no expectations going in. All I knew, my main goal was never measured by money or how many people read it. It was measured by, if I put this on a shelf, is, does, is it going to look good next to other books? Is it going to have any credibility when people read it? That was what I wanted to accomplish. I feel like I accomplished that. Um, and then as I started pushing it and getting people to talk about it, um, I was overwhelmed by the reaction. It, it's gotten very positive feedback. Um, pro like in hindsight, the most negative thing is probably it could have gone through the editing process a little better. Um, but I, I don't think it's a bad book and other people don't seem to think so either. And there's the imposter syndrome that kicks in where I'm kind of like, all right, I'm 70 re uh, reviews in. When are the bad ones coming? And I don't know if that feeling is ever going to go away, but there, you know, it's, this goes back to the anxiety. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of waiting for it. And then, uh, you know, I just put out the tickle monster in uh, October and you know, it's, it's doing very well. And I'm same feeling, Hey, when are the bad ones coming? All right. It's a totally different book. I, I, I had to do something wrong and I'm kind of waiting for it. And, um, any, any critiques I get, they're very minimal and they're, they're very, uh, understandable. Um, you know, no book is perfect. I, there's books I read that are beloved that I, I'm, I just don't vibe with the same, but then there's books I love that, you know, people don't. Um, one of the things I learned in the process between Devils That Pray and Tickle Monster is the value of beta readers and the value of a newsletter, which I don't have yet. When I did Devils That Pray, I'm, I was shooting from the hip. Um, I'm watching YouTube videos from other authors and I'm trying to piece things together that uh, supposedly work and seem like something I can do very easily. Um, when I did Tickle Monster, I enlisted beta readers and people that had interest in my past work. When I started, you know, teasing the Tickle Monster and revealed the title, you know, that, that title alone, it's a fun title. It gets attention. People want to know the Tickle Monster. That's weird. Like it, it's a fun title, but it, it's not a fun book. Um, yeah, so some, that, those are some of the things I learned, though, was definitely uh, lean into the beta readers. You're going to get a lot of valuable feedback. You're going to get um, a lot more ideas of what's working and what's not. And one thing that I, I, in hindsight, I wish I would have created a website between Devils of That Prey and Tickle Monster, because that's, that's one of the common things I'm starting to see, like, well, I'm not, I haven't been interested in traditional publishing, but I'm open to the idea, but I know 
okay, if I go this route, I need to have a, a email newsletter. I need to have an established, you know, subscription base. Um, so it's one thing that I'm building social media and all that stuff and having all these avenues, but I need to really, uh, I need to check all those boxes. I think if I need to be taken professionally or seriously as a professional beyond self-publishing, and I don't know when that's going to come, but it's definitely something that's on my mind is, uh, I'm, I'm coming up with goals for 2024. That's something that might be on the bottom of the list. Maybe at the 2025 thing, but it's, uh, it's definitely something I'm thinking about now. That's awesome. I, I always say, hey, run before you can walk, you know, just jump in, figure it out later. I'm really glad to hear that. Um, and especially getting, you know, upwards of, of 70 reviews for a book, you know, independently publishing it. That That is a, a big accomplishment. I know a lot of smaller presses where their books do not have anywhere near that amount of reviews. So congratulations there. Um, we only have a minute left here. So just rapid fire. What are you watching? What are you reading? What What should you get other people interested in? Um, currently reading Sundial by Catriona Ward. Um, I'm, I'm only about 20% through. I'm on the hook. I don't have a strong feeling about it yet, but where's this thing going? Um, what I'm watching, I just finished watching Midnight Mass and Haunting of Hill House on Netflix. Um, I'm really late to that party. Loved Midnight Mass. I watched that one first. I can't stop thinking about it. Um, I want to watch it again. I think I'm going to watch it with my girlfriend. <laughs> and, uh, and then what was the, what was the other question? Uh, well, no, that, that was it. What are you reading? What are you watching? Oh, okay. And um, yeah. since the uh, the meeting is about to die on us real quick, I do want to thank you for coming back on. I would actually like to have you back on because I feel like you have a lot of things to talk about that we haven't even covered here. So um, sure. thank you. Thank you so much for the time. Uh, it's been great. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll try to get this posted very soon. Oh, awesome. Thank you for having me. Okay. Well, I will talk to you later. Thanks so much, David.